Welcome back, everyone. Council, are we ready to continue? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon, members of the audience. We are ready to proceed with the next witness. Mr. Usher, can you kindly bring in the witness? Thank you.
I say any singer, do swear that I'll speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you, Mr. Usher. Good afternoon, Mr. Sengor. Good afternoon. We have met on a few occasions, um, and as you know, my name is Sagar, and I will be questioning you today on behalf of the commissioners. Please assume a comfortable seating position. Just lean back in your chair and just draw the microphone closer to you. Speak loudly and clearly into the microphone so that everyone can hear, hear you in the hearing room. Also allow a few seconds between my questions and your answers to avoid overlap in speech and also to assist the interpreters who are also interpreting your testimony into the different local languages. Um, we've met um, a few times, like I said, and um, I have previously warned you about the duty to tell the truth. And um, I've also took an offense um, under the TRRC Act not to tell the truth, to lie to the Commission. I'll give you a brief overview of the um, main topic that we'll be discussing today. I'll go through briefly um, with you on your personal details and some of, the bi some of your biographical um, information, but we will mainly focus on the events of the 11th day of April 2000 and um, also your subsequent victimization and um, the treatment that you received um, um, as a result of the injuries that you sustained um, on that day locally here in the Gambia as well as um, abroad. You will also be given um, an opportunity to say um, some final words to the Gambian public after the commissioners have questioned you. I hope that is understood. Yes. Are you ready to proceed with your testimony? Yes. Okay. Kindly tell me what your name is. My name is uh, Seni Senga. And uh, where do you live? I am living in Bara. And where is Bara? In the North Bank region, Lower Nyum. And what is your date of birth and your current age? I was born 19, uh, 26 July 1986. And where were you born? I was born in Lamen, Combo North. Can you give me a brief um, summary of your educational background? I attended Maninarim Primary from 91 to 96. After my common entrance, I was uh, sent to Berending Junior Secondary from 96 to 99, where I did grade 7 to grade 9. From 99, I sat to the grade 9 exams, then I proceed to SL Senior Secondary, where I, from 99 to April 2000, April 11, 2000. So basically, I spent roughly about three to four months in senior secondary. That is from 99 September to April 11, 2000. And what grades were you um, when you attended SL Senior Secondary School? So, What grades were you in when you attended um, SL Senior Secondary School? Grade 10. I was in grade 10. Did you complete? No. Okay, can you tell us why you did not complete? Because of the event of April 10th and 11. Okay, kindly um, tell us what happened on the 11th day of April 2000. On the 11th day of April. Please um, lean back in your chair and just ah, draw the microphone. Yeah, just be comfortable, please. Yes, okay. Please go on. On April 11, it was on a Tuesday, 
actually on Monday we, we I went to school we already have our maths examination papers so on the Tuesday we were supposed to have our biology exams which I studied hard for because then our biology teacher was a P school an American she promised us that the best three students out of her subject she will provide scholarships for them knowing the background that I was coming from I studied hard to make sure that I was among the first three students so that I could benefit from the scholarship she promised um, can you tell us what the background you were from was like? Just explain so that we can understand what kind of family background that you came from. I am from an extended family. And most of my siblings were dropouts because of financial difficulties from my parents. I was not actually living with them. I was with my uncle. So I was the only one who was locked to go up to grade 10. So I feel it was necessary for me to study hard. At least the money that was supposed to be used on me will be given to another person among the family so anyone could benefit and go to school uh, just like me. I studied hard, spent the whole night reading. On the morning, when we prepared and get to school. Upon arrival at the gate, we found students standing there and some of these teachers too were outside the school gates. Can you tell us which school you're referring to? I mean SO Senior Secondary. Then they told us that there is no schools today. I asked why. They said there is going to be a demonstration today because already one has already taken place in Combo and they have killed most of the students there. Can you tell us who told you that there was going to be um, a demonstration? and who was going to demonstrate and what they were going to demonstrate about. There were a lot of students standing outside because it was exams period. Obviously, all the students will come to school to, for their papers. But like what has happened in the combo, they said it was necessary for them to, to do the same demonstration because it affects a member of them, one or two members of them, which are the students and the subsequent clean killings of other students. Please elaborate um, on what had happened um, the previous day. The previous day, when I asked, they told me they demonstrate because they have two students who were victimized one by the name Ibrahim Abari, a boy from Foster Senior who was beaten by the paramilitaries, eh, sorry, the fire and rescue services, which led to his subsequent death. And a girl, Binta from Birkamaba, who was raped at the independent stadium by the security personnel who were to protect her as well. So that was the reason they said they will demonstrate to seek justice for them. So you're saying that the previous day, which was um, the 10th day of April 2000, yes. students um, demonstrated as a result of these two incidents that you mentioned. Correct. Can you tell us where these demonstrations took place? Um, within the combos, on the 11th, that was the day it affected the provinces, that is, in the urban area, rural areas of the Gambia. Okay. Before we move on to the 11, just kindly tell us what um, happened during the demonstrations that occurred 
on the 10th of April in the Combos. Students were shot. We have 14 of them who passed away, including a Red Cross volunteer and a three-year-old boy. And kindly tell us um, how the students came to the decision to demonstrate on the 11th uh, day of April 2000. At the time, there was a student body called GAMSU. They have their executives. They organized themselves. They tried to engage the government through the Minister of Education and the authorities involved. But they were not ready to listen to them. And they feel it was necessary for them to come out and protest, which is their right, and seek for justice for the two victims, that is Binta and Ibrahim Obari. So kindly continue and tell us um, what happened on the 11th day of April 2000 um, at your school, SL Secondary School. Yeah, like I said, when we get to the school and they say there is no school because of there is going to be a demonstration. I was there with uh, my friends and my relatives whom I came from, with, from the same compound with. If I could remember, I was there with um, Momo Dujub, Habib Jeng, who is an uncle, Adam Achoy, who is a friend. So we said, as far as there is no school, we have to go home. But we were, we were supposed to go to Bara, and these people, they decided that they are going to Bara, from SL to Bara. The demonstration was only meant from SL to Bara. So we said, let's go home. On the way coming, the, the group is behind us. We were in front. At Can you tell us what group you're referring to? The students that are coming from the school. And what were they doing? On the way coming, they were uh, shouting <coughs> justice, justice, that they want justice for Ibrahima and Binta. So these were the students who were actually demonstrating? Yes. Okay, please continue. On the way coming, when we reach at SO, there is a way bridge that the GPA use to weigh the vehicles that are crossing the ferry. They passed by there and broke the glass windows of the buildings there. Can you tell us what they used to break the glass windows? They used stones. They threw on the windows and break them. <coughs> From there, a proceed coming towards Barra. Um, before we um, go there, tell us what the behavior of the students were like, apart from breaking the glasses and shouting um, justice for the students. What was their general behavior? It was not violent, I can tell. Apart from the uh, glasses that they break, the only thing that we, they were saying is justice and we want justice for the two victims, that is Ibrahim and Binta. Did they seem to be angry? Obviously they will be angry because you will not feel fine when your colleague is being victimized which caused his death and a lady being raped, a teenager for that matter. Obviously they will be angry. So you said um, you were walking um, from SL, going towards Barra with your friends. Yes. Can you tell us what your proximity was um, to the students who were demonstrating? Where were you and where were the students who were demonstrating? We were just in front of them. The proximity was not uh, that long. We were just some meters away from them. And can you tell us whether you were part of those demonstrations? <clears throat> Initially, no, because when we were coming from the school, we decided that we are going home. But 
That was the only route we could use to get to Bar. It's the main highway that we can use to get to Bar. And they were behind us, so obviously it will look like we are in the same group. But you were not part of the, the student demonstrations in Bara? At the beginning, no, but later on I, I see myself as being part of it. Because after then, I understand if I was Ibrahim Abari, probably Ibrahim Abari that passed away would have stand for me and demonstrate. I have sisters. If my sister was being raped, I will not feel happy. So when I see somebody else's sister being raped, the same feeling that I feel for my sister is the same feeling I would feel for her. So initially, although you did not want to um, join the demonstrations, you later resonated with the demonstrators and decided that you would join them. Yes. Okay. Tell us what happened as you left Esau, walking down the highway, going towards Bara. Yeah. After we left, they left the GPA when we come in. Around Esau, before the health center, there is a police checkpoint. Uh, just about 100 or 200 meters away from the checkpoint, we saw security personnel standing on a line. Tell us um, what kind of security personnel you saw. These were police officers. And on the line, they were holding guns, that is AK-47. Do you remember how many do you remember how many of them there were? Can you give an estimate? There will be more than two because it, it is a checkpoint and if you have more than five to six police officers at a checkpoint, obviously it's not normal. So there were more than, more than five, I would say up to ten. Please continue. Uh, when we saw them standing, we halted, then they started shooting. But when they start shooting, they did not shoot directly at us at the first place. They shoot as we hear the gunshots. When I turn to run, I felt something hit my leg. What, what leg um, did you feel something? My right leg. That is the outside of my thigh. Because I turned to run, I d obviously I faced them. So when I turned to run, that is the reason when they, when they shot it get to the side of my leg. When I felt something hit me, I was like, I don't know, my leg stiffed, so I have to raise it up. When I remove my hand, I saw blood all over my hand. So I said to my brother, I think I am shot. So that is Momodu, I mean, Momodu Job. He wanted to come and help. I told him, no, you have to run. If not, you will be shot. At that point, I could not move. So I felt on the ground. After some time, the nearby compound the landlord came out to help me. Okay, let's, let's, let me just take you a few steps um, back. You mentioned that um, when the par paramilitary pointed their guns, they did not initially direct the guns at, at the students. Where were they directing the guns towards? No, if I said they did not direct, they did not shot directly on us, but they shot like above our head. That, that would be one of the right. I only, I, I only heard of 
two, three or four shots, then I felt something hit my leg. And where did those shots come from? Obviously from the security personnel. Okay. Um, tell us what happened after you, you fell down um, near a neighboring compound. Yeah, the landlord came out of his compound. He helped me with <coughs> some of the students that were in, the, in his compound. I could recall one, Mudumaron. He has to remove his uniform and tied it on my leg because I was losing a lot of blood at that time. And these students who were um, in, in the compound, um, what students were they? Who were they? And what were they doing there? They were students from SL school. We came from the same school, but I think they risked their life coming out to help me. After I was shot, they decided to come out and help me, roast me inside that compound. What were they doing in that compound? When they started shooting, they, ro they rushed get into that compound so they could have, I would call it a fortress, where to hide. So kindly continue and tell us what happened next. When they get me into his compound, it's not too far away from the hospital. It will be like 150 meters away from the hospital. They, they use his bagway, he has a bagway. They use his compound back door and rush me to the hospital. That is the SLO Health Center. Can you tell, tell me why they were using the back way instead of the main road? Because the security personnel were on, on the, at the checkpoint and they were shooting at that time, continually shooting at that time. I later on felt very dizzy, so I started losing consciousness a little bit. Can I just clarify a few points? Um, after you actually shot and you fell down, did any of the security officers approach you or offer any assistance to you? No, no, no. Not at that time. Okay. So you said... reduced the flow of the blood that I was losing. But they have to contact my family immediately so that they could prepare and rush to Banyul because I was losing a lot of blood and they would need blood transfusion so they will need blood donor. Which hospital were you rushed to um, at SL? RVH. In, in SL, which hospital did you refer to? That, that is the SL Health Center. Oh. So what happened after you got to the health center and they contacted um, members of your family to donate blood? Yeah, after that they prepared me and I was transferred to the RVH. Did you receive any other treatment from SL Health Center before you were referred to RVH? I understand the, the, I was injected because I was feeling a lot of pain and I said to them, I was really feeling pain. If they can give me anything that can subsidize the pain. And that was the time they injected me. I feel almost something like five or more injections at the time. Actually, the nurse that was, who the head nurse at the time, we happened to come from the same village, Lemming. She was Auntie Malen, and I have another Auntie, Auntie Ramu, who was a nurse there. So they took me as it was their responsibility to take care of me. Auntie Malen has to join the ambulance and 
come with me to the RVH. And you said you eventually um, fell unconscious. Yes. What happened when you regained um, consciousness? Where did you find yourself? That would be after two days that I just saw myself in a, in a room with a lot of people standing by. The first person that I realized was, recognized was my mom. <laughs> She was T sitting next to time. me. Are you okay? Take yeah, your time. I'm fine. I'm yeah, please continue. She was sitting next to me. I, I show members of my families and friends. But then I could not talk because I was on severe pain. So it's correct that you were actually in a coma for two days? If not come up, then probably I was not just feeling conscious, maybe come up, I could say. But In any case, you were not conscious of your surroundings yeah. during these two days, and you couldn't remember what happened as well. I have to wake up around five or four o'clock in the night because I was feeling very hungry. So that do, the first five days, I spent the night with my father, so I have to wake him around five, four, four o'clock and tell him I was really feeling hungry that I wanted to eat. He has to provide, it, it was bananas and some juice, at least to get something in my stomach. All right, um, can you just tell us um, after the first two days when you regained consciousness and saw members of your family surrounding you, did you eventually um, realize where you were? Mm. Yeah, because I saw the nurses, so I obviously know I, I am in a hospital, and it's a, it's a ward. But the place was so strange to me, because then I've never been at the RVTH, so I didn't know how it looks like. Can you tell us what the RVH or RVTH um, is? Can you give us the full name? Royal Victoria Teaching Hospital. And what is that hospital um, known as um, presently? I think it's the RVTH, it's the Royal Victoria Teaching Hospital, the major, major referral hospital in the Gambia, in Banyu. Do you know if the name has changed? Edward Francis, oh, sorry, Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital. Okay, all right. So you said you were in severe pain after you regained consciousness. Yes. Do you know if anything happened um, during those two days that you were at the hospital? Did anything, did anything happen to you? Did you receive any treatment? Yeah, I understand they took me to the theater and the bullet was removed from my leg. This I was told by the doctor who operated me. And who was the doctor that operated on you? He's an Egyptian doctor. He was Dr. Nawa. And um, can you tell us where the bullet was retrieved from and what other information the doctor gave you about your injuries? He said he removed the blood from my inside of my leg and I, I have four to five blood vessels that were cut. Five of my blood vessels were cut but he managed to repair them. Did anything else happen to any part of your leg? After that, yeah, I, I understand they put sort of a nail, it will be of, of this size, into the, f the flesh of my leg. Sorry, can you repeat that? They put what? It will be a metal. A metal. A piece of metal. A piece of metal. Yes. Just like this size and it was put into the flesh of my leg just below the knee for, that what, was for what purpose sorry for interrupting you to stretch the leg then things were not that much advanced they will use that and have this 
small bags that they will put sand in it. It will weigh something like, it will be more than five, six, maybe 10, not up to 10 kilos, or probably 10. They will use that to stretch your leg so that the bone will get back to its normal place. Can you tell us what happened to the bone in your leg? You haven't mentioned it yet. I had a fractured bone. And how did that happen? How was your bone fractured? It was a multiple fracture. Because I, the distance from which I was shot was not too far, so it, has to, it causes a lot of damage to my bone. Are you saying that the bullet that shot you basically yes. caused these multiple fractures in your leg? Yes. So as a result, they had to use this piece of metal inserted in your, in your flesh, yes. um, just above the knee? Below the knee. Below the knee? Yes. Okay. And what was this supposed to do? That, that's what I am saying. They, they use it, they would tie a sound of back with, with some kilos there will be a rope that will be tied by the leg and it will stretch the leg so that the bone will get back to its normal place. And when you had regained consciousness and woke up at RVH, this operation had already been done and this piece of metal was, had already been inserted into your leg? Yes. And how did it feel when you, when you woke up? It was, it was so painful. <laughs> That was so painful, very, very painful. I would ask the nurse to give me pain relief just to subsidize the pain and sleep a little bit. Were you given any other um, treatment by the Egyptian doctor? Yeah, during the process they will give me some medicines and I do take a lot of injections. Every day I would take up to 10 injections a day or more because they said the blood was not flowing as it should through my leg. So they, they use a lot of injection so it could pump the blood to get to my leg. And can you tell us why the blood wasn't pumping into your leg? Because uh, I have my blood vessels that were cut. And eventually, um, did you have um, proper flow of blood into your leg? No. After that, it even caused <coughs> another problem because blood was not flowing so my foot started gangrening i think that is a bio, um, scientific term i don't know. You, you developed gangrene gangrene yeah on my toes and tell us the symptoms of this gangrene what what did your foot look like it was all black it was totally dead did you have any sensation in that area? Did you feel anything? No, I would not feel anything. It was completely dead. So when, you, when it started uh, looking that seep, they increased the number of uh, injections that I would take by the day, probably to 15 by the day. At some point, when they use, is it a cannula, to inject me, it freezes at some point, so you have to use water to sterilize it, to make it flow. But with that, you... Please take your time. I know that this is a very painful experience to recount, but just take your time and, and tell us what happened. You feel a lot of pain, but 
I just have to take it. Enjoy it. At some point, I would even tell the nurse, any time that I see you, I know it's injection. He eventually turned to be a friend. So the treatment that you received, the surgery you received from the doctor and the different treatments, including the multiple inject injections, did not actually help with the gangrene that you developed um, in your foot? No, no, it, it did not help. It continues like that. At some point, I have to ask him, why is my tools in this shape? He would tell me it will be fine, just because the blood was not flowing. But with these injections, it will soon be okay. So he kept reassuring you and telling you that you would get better? Yes, that, yes, exactly. And did you get better? No. When you found yourself um, at the hospital ward at RVTH, were you the only were you the only one who was in that ward, or did were there other patients in that ward? There were other patients because this was the second day of the demonstration, so obviously there were other patients there. The the, the ward was full with students. I would say 95 percent of the patients there were students. And how big was the ward? This is eight and three at the RVH, it's a sizable ward. And how many patients would it normally um, accommodate? It was more than 20 at that time. And you're saying that 95% of these patients were all Student. student victims from the yes. different um, demonstrations that happened on the 10th and 11th of April 2000? Yes. Do you remember any of the victims um, that you shared the word with? Yes, I, I can remember Lamin Ture. He was a student of Gambia High. Mm. What injuries did he sustain? He has, a very, he has a very, very serious injury on his leg because his right leg was amputated. Immediately he gets to the hospital. Mm, there was one Bakar Injai, Abdukarim Jame. Can you tell us what injuries Bakar Injai had and where he was from? I would not know the school he was from, but he was shot on his leg. Abdukarim Jame was from Maska Senior. He was shot on his knee. We have one Omar Sose, he was from St. Augustine's. He too was shot on his leg. It's, it's 19 years, most of them I could not recall them anymore. It's been Abu a while. Karim Jame, you mentioned, who was uh, not, um, shot on his knee. What injuries did he sustain on, on the knee? His kneecap has a problem. Up till now, his knee cannot bend completely. He cannot bend his knee. He's using a walking stick to help himself walk. And these are students from the Combos? Yes. Um, can you kindly tell us, um, is it correct that they were victims from the April 10th demonstrations that you mentioned in evidence? Yes, they were, they were victims of April 10. And can you tell us who, who shot them? Obviously, it will be the security personnel who shot them. And um, where did you get this information from? It was all over the country. And when we get to the hospital, we come to know each other. And everyone will start explaining his or her story. And all of the patients that you mentioned, the student victims that were in your ward, um, were they all shot by the security forces that you mentioned? Yes, they were shot, yes. Did anything unusual happen um, after you 
were admitted in the hospital, did anything, did anything unusual happen? Yes, we, that was this day that we shared, and they said, yeah, Jamie will be coming to the hospital to see the patient, the victims. In which Yaya Jame are you referring to? I am Yaya Jame, the former head of state. Okay, kindly continue. On the day that he came to the hospital, I know he himself knows that these people, they did not prepare to see or talk to me. But because we were all like, we will not talk to him. I personally did not talk to him. I did not even looked at him because the moment he gets into the ward, I pretend as I was sleeping. I have to cover my face. Why did you behave in, in such a manner? I would say this in like in all of you cannot order or give instructions to kill innocent children and at the same time you want to come and show sympathy to those kids. What sense does it make? Please tell us um, how you came to the conclusion that he gave the order to shoot the students. He was the head of state, even though he was not in the country. If the vice president act on on his absence, he is still see, he or she is still acting on his behalf. And where was he um, during the April 10th and 11th demonstrations? I later understand he travelled out of the country. And um, while he had travelled, who was representing him in the Gambia? I certainly I said he was representing. And do you know what, if anything, she had to do with the instructions to shoot the students on the April 10th and 11th? The, the unfortunate part of it is his representative who was in charge in his absence was a woman who has kids, who knows what it costs when you see your children in certain conditions, was the first person who, who came out to say the shooting started from the students. But the sad story is there was no security personnel who even has a bruise on his body, on his or her body. So her saying that means she was totally aware of what was happening and the situation at the time. She too is responsible of what has happened to the students. And you're referring to Aisa Tunjai Seidi, the previous uh, Vice President of the Gambia? Obviously, yes. Can you tell us where she made these statements that you refer to? On national TV, television and the radio. Is it correct that you said um, she accused the students of shooting at the security officers first? Yeah, that is what he said, that the students, shooting started from the students. Meaning, when the security personnel shoots back, they were defending themselves. Did you hear the announcement that she made? I later on had to hear it from people. I personally did not hear it over the air because I was in hospital at the time and RVH, they will not be watching GRTS at that time, so it's obvious. What is certain is he, she was the one who said it. I am sure of that. And um, can you just tell us um, when, when she made this statement, I mean, what, what was the reaction from, from the public when she made the statement that it was the students who started shooting? Or what did you make of that particular statement? I know people will feel bad, but the reaction 
would not have any impact because if innocent, innocent children can be shot and 14 of them were shot to death, if the vice president made those remarks and you want to challenge her, you might probably see yourself as those 14 students that were shot to death. Was there any evidence of the fact that the students were carrying weapons and had the ability to shoot at security personnel on, the, on those two dates, the 10th and 11th of April? Maybe she saw it, but I don't think. It was on exams they threw out the Gambia. So it's obviously students were just with their pens and pencils and exercise books ready for their exams. You were demonstrating with students at SL Senior Secondary School. Did any one of you um, have weapons? No, I did not see it. And the students who were in the combos as well, did you receive any information to suggest that they actually had weapons with them? No, not. What about the security personnel? Were any of them shot, injured, or killed as a result of um, these shots that they claim came from the students? Nobody was admitted at the hospital. That is a security personnel who was shot because of the demonstration. I did not see it. And there was no confirmation of any security personnel who was admitted at the hospital. Okay. Kindly tell us um, what happened when um, Yai Jami came to the hospital and visited you. When he came there and he got to my bed, <laughs> I pretend as I was sleeping. So it was a group of people. We have all these doctors, senior doctors at the RVTH. I can feel the the were holding my leg and giving him the impression that all these boys will be okay and they will continue their normal lives. And did you think that was an accurate statement at that point? That was not the case. It was not an accurate statement. They were just saying that to please him. Did he come with other people um, when he came to visit you? Did you notice any senior government officials with him? I did not want to look at these people. I feel I was sleeping. So I, I covered up my head. I closed my eyes. I, I know there are so many people. There are so many security personnel there, military officers. With, they came with their guns in the hospital, mouth to mouth, everywhere, guard everywhere, even in the wards. Were you intimidated by that, considering the fact that you were shot by security officers? No, no, no. Already I have undergone. I know what being shot looks like, so I don't mind them. Even if they killed me at the time, I would feel okay. okay. So after the doctors reassured um, yeah, Jamie that all of you would be fine, what, what happened next? Did he do anything else? No, eventually my condition continued to deteriorate together with <coughs> Asan Suare and Yusuf Ambai, who was at the intensive care unit for more than two weeks or more. This is the first time you're mentioning um, Yusuf, Yusuf Ambai, did you say? Yes. You said he was at the intensive um, care unit? Yes. Okay, so um, this was different from the ward that you were in? No, no. It's, yeah, it's different. He was in the ICU. Were there other student victims who were also in the ICU? No, I only know of him. But I know Asan was upstairs at 6 and 7 ward because he, he was shot in his stomach. Can you tell us who Asan was? Asan what? Asan Suare. He too was a student from, from? Masca. Where is Masca located? He's within the combos. And he was a Red Cross volunteer too. What about um, Yusufa Mbayas? Which school did he come from? He was in Pipeline Comprehensive. We will come back to these two um, victims, but um, I just want to take you um, back to the visit uh, from, from Yai Jame. I had previously asked you a question about if he did anything um, after, um, during or after the visit that he made, made to you. Do you remember? Yeah. him doing anything for you? Yeah, after his visit, just one fine day, 
there is this lady that came with provisions and she said she's coming from the office of the president who was the lady um, she was Fatumata Jahum Pasisi. And who was she? At the time, I don't know what her position was, but I know she was coming from the office of the president. And what did she bring? She, she came with provisions, biscuits, juice, um, conflicts. But I did not eat it. I told my mom, you have to give this to you have to give it out so he have to, he gave it to other patients who were not victims he just gave it to them she just gave it to them i said i was not going to use it why did you refuse to use them i understand it was coming from here and to protect our life was much more important than giving us provisions When he was at the hospital visiting you, did he say anything about, um, you know, justice being done in, in your case or prosecuting those who actually inflicted these injuries upon you? No, not, not at that time. He did not say anything. He, he was just walking from bed to bed. And when he gets there, he will just ask the doctors what is his condition, what I uh, hope he will improve and stuff like that. I will have him saying, but I did not want to look at him. And most of the students in the world did the same thing. We have this very good nurse in the home at our ward. They will brief us, he is coming here, but if you can avoid talking to him, you guys better do that. Because they felt it was so unjust for those kind of things to happen to kids. Um, and do you know how long it was after you were in hospital that uh, Yai Jami came to visit you? I, I did not remember actually how long it takes, but it will be after one month or so. One month, it will be after one month. And do you know whether before or after this time anything was actually done about your situation? I mean, were there any arrests made? I mean, were the security officials who, who shot at you arrested for what they had done? No, no, no. I had never heard of any security personnel who was arrested. Was there any prosecution? They shut up an inquest to look into the matter of April 10th, 11th. And what um, inquests are you referring to? Commission of Inquiry. When was this um, set up? This was set up in 2000, and in 2000, but it was in August. Then I was already taken to Egypt. It was in my absence that that inquiry was set up. And do you know what happened as a result of that inquiry? Did anything fruitful come out of it? The commission made their recommendations, but all those that were to be prosecuted were being indemnified. This is what bring about the indemnity bill, and there is impunity. Uh, it brings impunity out of it. Tell us more about the indemnity bill. What, what was that? This was to indemnify the perpetrators who shot at students and those that were responsible in the killings of the students were the ones that were indemnified. And by them being indemnified, do you mean that they could no longer be prosecuted in court? Exactly. And therefore, um, you, you basically had no legal remedy for what they had done to you? Exactly. You mentioned that, um, sorry, let's just go back to the two victims that you mentioned, Yusuf Mbai, who was in ICU, and also Asan Suare. Yes. 
Can you kindly tell us more about Yusuf Ambai? How did you know Yusuf Ambai? Yusuf is a family member, I could say. His father was named after my... I have a younger brother who is named after his father. My mom and his mom are best of friends, and my younger brother was named after his father. So eventually, it became a family tie. And because of that, I had my younger brother, Ali, who has to sacrifice and drop out of school so that he can be taken care of Yusufa because he is paralyzed from the neck down. He can't do anything for himself. So Ali had to sacrifice his educational career so that he could be taken care of Yusufa for his daily activities. And um, this Ali you mentioned, um, what are his full names? He's Ali Senghor. Is he your biological brother? Yes, he's my biological brother. He's my younger brother. And where does he work? He's currently working here in the TRRC as a victim support unit officer. And you're saying that he was brought up by Yusufa's family? Yes. Can you tell us how Yusufa was actually shot? Actually, it's because he went after during the demonstration he knew Ali was at, went to school. So, because he was so young, or I think he was in grade six or grade seven. So he decided to go and look for Ali, which eventually caused him being shot. That was on the 10th of April. So he was shot whilst he was out looking for Ali? Yes. And eventually, Ali had to sacrifice his education to, to look after him. Yes, that was the only thing he could do to pay back what Yusufa was trying to do for him. And um, sorry to interrupt you. Have you finished? Yes. Where was he shot? He was shot on the neck here, and it has to affect his nerves, so he is paralyzed from the neck downward. His spinal cord was affected, is that correct? Yes. So he's paralyzed from the neck down? Yes. And um, what other symptoms does, does he have? Is he able to do anything for himself, being paralyzed? He is on a wheelchair for 19 years. He can't do anything for himself. Tell me about Asan Suara that you mentioned. What ward was he in? Asan was in 6 and 7. He's is the word that is up after eight and three you get up you, if you climb up there was where he was admitted Hassan was shot in his stomach which eventually caused him lost one of his kidneys was there any other um, symptoms that developed from that yeah use, he norm, normally filled his stomach he would have this swollen stomach and always oozing, how to call it, something oozing coming out of his uh, stomach, which has complications, and he mostly have felt this severe pain. Could only eat soft food, cake, and stuff like that. Even if he eats rice, he have to have problems. Did Yusuf and Asan have any medical treatment like we did at the RVTH? Yeah, we were there. We all received the same normal treatments. At some point, Yusuf has to be evacuated to Egypt because his condition was getting worse. Before he was evacuated to um, Egypt, can you tell us what treatment he received here at the RVH? He was operated. He was taken to the theater, operated. The blood was removed from his neck around here. It was removed around here. And an opening has to be made on his gullet here where only soft food can be pumped. 
for him that was the means he uses to eat which was so challenging his first operations was not good he has to be taken back to the theater the first operator has to be removed again and another one was made when i talk when we get to egypt the egyptian doctor will walk to his room and tell us i saved the life of this boy okay um we will get to um your trip to egypt um but i would just like to concentrate on what happened here um in the gambia before we get there can you tell us if um asan suare was also operated on here in the gambia Yes, he was operated because the blood, he has a blood, so he was operated and the blood was removed from his stomach and the affected kidney was also removed. And was that operation um, successful here in the Gambia? Yeah, I would say it was successful because if not, he could have lost his life. With Asan, actually he was removed among the dead bodies that were uh, at the accident and emergency or already they thought he he already passed away with the help of a cousin who was a red cross who rushed to the hospital he he actually went there to donate blood after removing patients that were dead already the dead bodies that was the time he realized this the, the boy here is still breathing but then he did not knew it was his cousin after he pulled him out of the dead bodies he recognized that it was his cousin that was even packed among the dead bodies wow what a fascinating story so i mean if he had not discovered him this poor boy would have just bled to death and been buried with 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 the other dead bodies yes um you mentioned your trip to egypt um but before we we get there can you tell us if there was any medical report that was done here in gambia on on your condition and the condition of asan as well as uh, yusufa or any other person any other student victim that was admitted at the rvh that you know of Yes there was a medical board that was set up to look into our conditions because it was getting out of hand my tooth were totally gangrene and they have no other solution to it so i think that board was co it comprises of i think it was dr cc if i could recall dr nawa was part of that board an egyptian Please tell us who Dr. Cisse was and who Dr. Nawa was and Dr. any Nawa other was an, Dr. Nawa was an orthopedic surgery doctor here. Mm. He was the one that operated on you, you he, and me, on me, on me. On you. Yeah. And we have this other doctor, Dr. Suleiman. He was a surgical doctor. He operated he, he operated on Asan and Yusufa. And these doctors were working at the RVH at the time? Yes. What about Dr. Cisse? Actually with Asan there is this other Nigerian doctor called Dr. Salako. Salako. He was a surgeon. He he did help Asan a lot because he was staying at the hospital. So any time he was called for Asan, he would just come and give assistance and get back to his room. He was a Nigerian, Dr. Salako. Did you know of any other members of the medical board? Um, we have this other Egyptian doctor too, Dr. Gruber too. He too was among. And what nationality was Dr. Gruber? He was Egyptian. Um, you mentioned a few Egyptian doctors at RVTH. RVTH. Um, how did they come to be employed there? not that i did not know probably that is government where they were here it was the government that brought them to the gambia to work yes, there yes exactly <clears throat>
At the time, who was the minister, minister of health? It was Dr. Njai, Malik Njai. And what about the director of health services? Dr. Maria Tujalo. And was she directly in charge of RVTH at the time? Yes, she was directly in charge of RVTH. Okay. So tell us um, what happened uh, with the medical board. What did they do and did they make any recommendations on your behalf? Yes, after they did their examinations and all stuff, they recommended that we needed overseas treatment at a more sophisticated uh, country. They've told us we we recommend for you guys that is um, you Hassan and Yusufa to be taken to either <coughs> America or Europe. But at some point they decided to change their mind and we were then evacuated to Egypt instead of America or Europe. And why did that happen? When I asked, they said it was because there are Gambians in the diaspora who were constantly following on our case and they really built interest in it and they talked a lot about it at the international level. So if they allow us to go to Europe or America, those people might use that opportunity and have something to say against our case to the international world against the Gambia government. And did you have any particular groups that were interested in, in your case at this point? Yes, at that time they called themselves concerned Gambians. We have one lady who was so prominent in that group. She happens to be an elder sister to Hassan. And she is Sigajain. Um, that was Sigajain, did you say? Yes, Sigajain, I mean. Okay, and um, what kind of activities did they do surrounding your matter? They, they were reporting our case to the international world, the UN, United Nations, human rights, EU, and they were so helpful, raising funds for us. I could even remember this, they do send us money sometimes when we were in Egypt. They do send us money to take care of our personal things. And as a result of this um, attention that you were getting, um, the government did not want you to go to a Western country, is that what you said? Yes, exactly. And why do you think they did not want um, that attention on, on you? What would be the reason? Maybe they, they have a hidden agenda that they don't want the international world to know. They don't want the West to know about our conditions and what led to the April 10th, 11th incident. So they did, they did not want the correct information about what happened to you to, to get out? Exactly. Okay. Um, can you just um, continue from where you, you stopped off and tell us what, what happened after the medical board met and um, made the recommendations uh, that they made? Yeah, after the recommendations that they made, they said they will take us to Egypt and that was the final thing they agreed on. Can Actually, you, sorry, um, Mr. Sengold, can you tell me if this was the first medical um, board that was set up to look into your case? No, it was not the first. There was a first medical board that first say we did not need an overseas treatment. Then the second one, that was when they said we needed overseas treatment. And um, you've already explained your situation, the operations um, that you had. 
and how unsuccessful they were, as well as um, Yusuf Ambais. Um, can you can you tell us whether the reason why you were referred for overseas treatment was because of the fact that these these operations that you had done locally were not successful? Yeah, though no, it will be part of it, and <coughs> they needed a vascular doctor to repair the vessels that were cut from my leg, and they needed an <coughs> angiogram scan, X-ray, which was not available at the time. Uh, that that was part of the medical report and the recommendations that they have. So, so the Gambia at this point, the Gambia did not have competent uh, medical services um, available for for you, and that is why you had to leave the country exactly. and seek treatment overseas. Exactly. Do you have a copy of the uh, medical report that was um, that was issued by the medical board? Yes. Okay. Um, if I show you the the report, will you be able to identify it? Yes. Okay. Mr. Usher, can you please um, show the witness the report? Thank you. Yes, it is. All right, thank you. Um, kindly give it back, please. Mr. Chairman, I would like to um, add in the record the medical board um, report on Sini Sengor, which is the witness, dated the 26th day of April 2001. And um, actually, the report is dated the 12th day of January 2001. My apologies. But there's a letter um, attached to it dated the 26th day of April 2001 um, from the then Director of Medical Services to Sini Sengor. I would like to add it as part of the record as Exhibit 0071. 72, my apologies, 0072. Fine. Uh, a, a and B, I am reminded. Request granted. Thank you. Um, Mr. Usher, can you kindly give this to the commissioners to have a look at? Mr. Chairman, as the commissioners are having a look at the report, I would just like to remind you that the medical report basically is recommending treatment for Sini Sengor overseas. Thank you. Mr. Sengor, can we kindly continue with our testimonies whilst the commissioners are looking at the report? Did you eventually go to Egypt? Yes, that would be two months after I was admitted at the RVTH. And that would then be June 2000? Exactly. Um, you mentioned that the three of you went to... Sorry, can you tell us who went to Egypt? It was three of us, me, Hassan, and Yusufa. But Yusufa was the first one who was taken to Egypt. He went there after two weeks, then I was taken there and Hassan. How was Yusufa taken to Egypt? Was he escorted by anyone? Yes, he was escorted by a doctor because his condition was so serious that he needed a doctor to escort him. Do you know what doctor escorted him? Yes, Dr. Nawa escorted him. And um, how were you taken to Egypt? How did you travel to Egypt yourself and um, Hassan? 
Mm. We traveled by air. You escorted by anyone? Yes, we were escorted by one nurse called Jula. She was the head nurse at the hospital at the ward 8 and 3. And the Egyptian doctor too went with, with us. That is Dr. Gruber. He too went with us. Um, tell us what happened when you traveled to Egypt. When we traveled to Egypt, we are, the day that we arrived, we arrived there, I think it would be around <coughs> 11 or 12 a.m. And we have to drive one hour 30 minutes to the hospital. <coughs> it's in Cairo, but it's in, it's in Agusa. There is Agusa. And that is um, an area in Cairo? It's an area in Cairo, yeah. Okay. At, at this point, how... What were your ages, all three of you? Uh, I was around 17. And Yusuf Ambai, how old was he? He was 17. We were almost age mates. What about Asan Suara? He too was 17. And um, you were minors at this point, you were children? Exactly. Did any of your family members accompany you? No. They said we cannot go with our family members. So we were escorted by Jula, the nurse, and she only spent one week with us at the hospital and she has to come back. So from that point onwards, you were on your own at the hospital in a foreign country? Yes. Okay, can you tell us what happened when you arrived in Egypt? Um, when we arrived that night, we were taken to our different what actually is a private block we were taken it to a room so the following day the, the following day they just came to my ward and and give me a paper and this would be around around three o'clock in the afternoon because in the night I was told not to eat in the morning so when I ate in the night I was told not to eat I can only drink water and juice but let me not eat food so around three they just came and give me a paper and said that I should sign this paper when I asked they said because you are you are going to the theater and it's obviously that you you should have to sign a paper before you are being taken to the theater which i did you signed this document yes did you have an opportunity to talk to your parents or any of your relatives before you signed that document considering the fact that you were a child at that point no, 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 not no. I couldn't. I couldn't talk to my family, and that would be after. I think that would be after two weeks when we get there. After the day that I talked to my mom and I explained to her how my operation operation went, I could feel she was crying in the background, but I was like. Mom, it was okay. It went fine anyway. So I just wanted to give her that courage. Okay. What about before you left the Gambia? Um, was it explained to you and your family in detail what operations you were going to have in Egypt? And did they give them an opportunity to consent or not? To no, this? they did not because when the medical report came out they just called them they just called them at the exec uh, at the admin block and told them the boys will be referred to egypt for further treatment but the kind of treatment that they would have there were not discussed with them because they did not tell me anything so did they eventually go ahead with the operation 
Yes, we go ahead with the operations and it lasted for eight hours. And what operation was this? This was um, this was when five of my toes were amputated because of the gangrene. And the blood vessels that were cut from my leg were repaired by the vascular doctor. At the same time, the fracture, multiple fracture of my leg was fixed at the same time. So um, you had actually, essentially you had three operations done? Yeah, at the same, simultaneously. And um, how did you feel afterwards? What was your physical condition? I was totally drilled because it, the operation was too long. Being under anesthesia for, anesthetic for eight hours, when I came out of the, the theater, it took me almost 24 hours before I could feel on my tongue, so it was totally dead. And apart from the nurse that accompanied you um, from the Gambia to Egypt, were there any other nurses at this hospital in Cairo who took care of you? Mm, in, that nurse, is they, they are only responsible of giving you medicine. They will not inject you. They will only come and give you medicine when the time for you to take your medicine. They will come and give you medicine. If you have been taken to the theater, they will escort you with your file to the gate and they will drop the file on your trolley and she would just say in Arabic, Rabana Khalik meaning good luck to you. I, I, that was what she would just say, Rabana Khalik. I don't know exactly. And um, how long did the nurse from the Gambia remain with you? One week. And um, what happened after that week? Who was caring for you? We were there alone. But the doctor that operated me here was there. He did not come back at that time. He had to spend almost a month with us there. Oh no, three which, which doctor weeks. Doctor are you doctor referring now, to? Doctor now. Three weeks with us. He will come to the hospital every day. <coughs> he if actually he attended my my operations there. During this time, did you have um, an opportunity to communicate with your family frequently? That is after two weeks that I had my operations. That was the first time you spoke to your family. Yes. I spoke to Siga before that time, but I didn't spoke to my mom or any other person within the family. Thank you, Mr. Senghor. Um, we'll have to stop um, there for now. We have our lunch break now, and um, we'll continue after the break. Mr. Commissioner, I'm um, sorry, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> it's time for a break, so we'll leave it um, there for now until we come back. Thank you very much, Council, and thank you, Mr. Senghor. We will take a one-hour break and come back at half past two sharp. Meeting is adjourned.